Our guest today on Faces of the Main Line at Radnor Studio 21 is Dr. Henry Perrins. Dr. Perrins is an author. He is a professor of psychiatry at Thomas Jefferson University. He is currently working at the Psychoanalytic Center of Philadelphia. Dr. Perrins has devoted his entire life to working with children that have been traumatized, which he'll explain later. Dr. Perrins is also a Holocaust survivor. Dr. Perrins, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I want to first say to you that we have, many of us have read Styron's Sophie's Choice. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us have watched Schindler's List. Um, we are familiar with Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Belzic, uh, Treblinka, Bergen-Belsen, historical events. But for me personally, the opportunity to sit with someone like yourself uh, is very moving. And uh, to use your word, it's a mitzvah. So thank you very much for taking this time. And I, I, uh, I would like to discuss mostly today the, your book, The Renewal of Life, Surviving the Holocaust. It's my pleasure to be here to talk with you. I appreciate your interest. Let me take you back to September 1st, 1939. Is that when the gates of hell opened? Uh, that was a preamble to it. That's, of course, when the Germans invaded Poland and disposed of Poland in six weeks, most destroying it as never been, as never as has never been done before. Okay, but uh, the gates of the gates of help opened when the German army turned to Western Europe and invaded Holland, Belgium, and France, and that was May first. 1940. That's when all hell broke loose. When your parents were divorced. Yes. So your brother Emmanuel went with your father. He stayed with my father in Lodge, Poland, where I was born, where we were the whole, the entire family is from, and we had family in Brussels. I don't altogether know what motivated my mother to select Brussels. But we went there, and I was about three, four years old at most when we got there. Your brother went with your father, you went with your mother. Do you, do you have a feeling about that? Oh, oh, a big feeling about that. It's one of the painful uh, things in my life, that I had a brother. Notice that I said I had a brother, three years older than myself. And all I remember of him is from the couple of photographs I have of him. Uh, I was about three or four when we went to Brussels, left our large family in Lodz in Poland, and um, my mother struggled to set herself up as a seamstress in Brussels. And we were there. Uh, speaking Yiddish, and I was learning French, which I spoke, of course, eventually in school. And we were there. We had some, a very, very nice family there. Um, occasionally, we would communicate with my father and my brother in Poland. My mother did that. And uh, things were going very nicely. I was doing fairly well in school. I've always been a good student. Uh, and uh, on May 1st, uh, 1940, uh, when German, Germany was, uh, the Germans invaded uh, Brussels, Belgium, Holland. Uh, for reasons I did not know then, but the Jewish population knew, if the German army comes into your country, you better get the hell out. Uh, I learned later of course, that the Jews were all informed as to what the intentions of the Nazis were. And I don't want to say the Germans were, because not all Germans were allied with their Nazi party. Kristallnacht happened on November uh, 9, during the night, uh, to the 10th, 
1938, Kristallnacht being the night of the broken glass, when the Germans were given permission, and legislation has been found that they were given permission, to destroy all properties that were Jewish, including uh, stores, uh, synagogues, and to make Jews do things that obviously would denigrate them and humiliate them, like, you know, scrub a sidewalk with a toothbrush, that kind of a thing. Some 90 Jews uh, were killed in that overnight uh, event. Uh, when I say that this was documented, um, and by the way, I should tell you that when I talk about this, I'm not as well organized in my head as when I give a lecture, okay? So, um, Shirer, who wrote the big, big book on World War II, uh, found documentation that it was per perfectly permissible for Kristallnacht to take, to take place. I don't want to give you the story of it, but Kristallnacht was really authorized by the Nazi uh, propaganda uh, unit in reaction to the, the, um, an ambassador to France, to Paris, being killed by a youth uh, who was about 18, 19 years old. Now, he wasn't intending to kill the German ambassador who was uh, situated in Paris, but one of his lieutenants came out and the young man, and I'm blocking on his name right now, shot him assuming that he was the ambassador. Now the reason that he did that is because prior to that, uh, by several months, the Germans had in, uh, forced many Jews in Germany to go back to Poland so that many Jews who had businesses in Germany had to drop everything and were exiled uh, to Poland. Uh, and that, of course, made this young man, young teenager, you can imagine what a 17, 18 year old, 19 year old teenager might do, uh, given their judgment not being sufficiently developed yet. Uh, that um, he wanted revenge, not realizing that by his taking revenge for his father's being exiled to Poland, that the Nazis would then have their revenge on what he had done by pr producing Kristallnacht. But in, Europe, in, in Brussels, they must have known this. That's why when the Germans would invade your country, Jews better get the hell out. So your mother got the hell out? Yes. And she went to France? We went to France. Did she France? Well, we went, we wanted to get out of, of uh, Bel Belgium. By the way, it's the only time that I, we hadn't, we didn't have to buy tickets to get on a train. The rides were free. You know. We went to wherever the train would take us. We passed by Dunkirk, which was then being bombed. I was 11 years old. When the train was bombed, my mother said, this was only thunder, not to worry about it. Mm. I was 11 years old. I, I knew that this was not thunder, funny thunder. You know, drôle de tonnerre, I said, in a funny thunder. Yeah. Uh, we got out of the train. The train was perfectly fine. We got back on, and we went on to southern France. We went as far as the environs of Toulouse, which are in the southern western quarter or eighth of France. There we disembarked, and by the way, the French greeted us very warmly. They came to the trains with sandwiches, with you know, uh, th water to drink, and uh, we were. Um, placed in a village uh, until th they would decide where we go, what we do, and so forth. 
there were many refugees coming, so that we were quite a headache for the French. But we were put in a village, and uh, since you uh, say that you read my, me my memoirs, you know that I described that. It was a really a very lovely village. It was a very nice village. We were quite nicely treated there. Uh, of course, uh, food was getting quite scarce. It seemed to all be shipped out to the military. We were there for several months. The German army that had finished Poland in six weeks did the same with France in five weeks. When they entered Paris, the French declared a, a wanted an armistice. They didn't want the Germans to go any further than Paris. Things happened after that. You were put at attention, sir? What happened is that in the course of the armistice, the Germans made demands of the Free France government, which I'll refer to as the Vichy France government. Uh, you know, the southern part of France was not occupied by the German army. The French authorities in Vichy France were convinced that Germany was going to win the war and was going to rule Europe for an endless period of time. There are always individuals who want to, to side with the authority, the powerful authority. And the Vichy France government produced a number of collaborators. You could not find better collaborators. Well, these days, I might think of a few collaborators that might equal the French collaborators at that time, but I will not mention their names on this program. Yes. The collaborators instituted then the Nuremberg Laws in France that had been adopted in Germany in 1935. The Nuremberg Laws are the well-known laws that de took away the citizenship of uh, German Jews. Physicians could no longer practice medicine in a community. They could practice medicine in their own group. Lawyers couldn't practice law. Those were the terrible 1935 Nuremberg laws that took away Jewish citizenship. And not just Jewish, but other people as well. Vichy France adopted those laws so that by the end of September, we were now brought together by the authorities and shipped to Toulouse, where, from where, within a few days, we were sent to our first detention camp. Was that uh, Rivesvelt? No, that was Récébédou, which was the first uh, concentration camp to which we were sent. What were the conditions like there? Uh, the conditions there were not so bad. These were brick barracks. Uh, it was a, a military, a former military post. Um, we were housed fairly nicely uh, within the barracks. Of course, we were all beginning to be very hungry. Uh, there was no school, uh, but we were not maltreated uh, in any way. Um, the interesting thing as a child psychiatrist that I noted, and I noted later, uh, is that there were a bunch of kids in Récébédou, after all, the Jews had children. Um, the kids didn't make friends. Can you imagine a bunch of kids in one place, they don't know each other, but how long will it take for them to start talking to each other and make friends? We were there for about four months. I don't remember a friend from there. We didn't make friends. And my explanation is that we were all shocked by what was going on. 
It was getting cold, too, by the way. You know, when we left France, when we left Bal uh, Brussels, we only took a small suitcase. We thought, hey, the French, you know, they are so powerful. The Germans aren't going to be able to cross the Maginot Line. Well, with their tanks, they just hopped right through them. And uh, so here we were stuck. The winter, of course, was coming on. And I should tell you, by the way, that southern France is at the latitude of Boston. You know, you think of southern France where all the good wine comes from, you know, which I appreciate very much. Notice that the good wine in the U.S. comes from the area around San Francisco, which is not so low in latitude. San Francisco is much warmer, you know, because of the currents of, in the Pacific. But winter was really setting in. With the Mistral? Yes. You know, the French love their winds. They give them names. Now, this, the, the Mistral is in southern France, but where we eventually went after we left Récébédou was La Tramontane. That's the, French, that's the name of the wind there. La Tramontane comes from the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean. Which borders Spain. Correct. The Pyrenees Mountains, of course, are the dividing line between France and Spain. Now, the Mistral is a nice wind. La Tramontane is not such a nice wind. It's a strong wind, and it is cold. We were told in late December that we were going to be moved to another camp. And... Um, only Jews were to come. That's when I learned that there were also Spanish refugees in Recebedu. From the Franco? From the Fra Franco uh, War. Uh, you know, and um, they crossed over the Pyrenees, uh, including Pablo Casals, for those who know music. Pablo Casals, the great cellist who established a festival in the Pyrenees Mountains, in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains on the French side. Well, they escaped the Franco War and were refugees in southern France. We were transported by train. Uh, they would send our luggage after. And um, we traveled during the night from Toulouse to Rivesalt. Rivesalt is at the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains near Perpignan. Perpignan is a, a large town, not that large, but on the eastern coast of France, of the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean coast, and right south of that is a village of Rivesalt, which had a, a camp. Now, the Rivesalt barracks were of a very different order than the barracks in Récebédou. These uh, barracks were wooden barracks. They were not in great shape either, so that the wooden slats, with their imperfect in imperfection and aware of the the wind in in uh, La Tramontane in uh, Rivesalt, there were cracks in the, in the walls, so that even within the barracks where there was no heat, we had to really cover ourselves fairly well. Food was diminishing at this point. You you there's a description in your book where you were giving a syrupy, and you, and it, and it spilled. Yes. Tell that story. Uh, the, the food, we were given a very <laughs> highly rationed diet. A piece of gray bread in the morning, at noontime, they called it soup. I assume they intended it to be soup. Warm water with a few pieces of vegetable in it. Rutabaga, actually, which is what 
as a root that they serve, the French serve their pigs. In the evening, another piece of bread and some rutabaga again, dry this time, not in the soup. In the mornings, when they brought the pieces, the, the bread, uh, they also brought a very watery syrup. Uh, the, the food was brought into the barracks in contrast to Vese Beidou, where we went to a dining hall. But in the Rivesalt, the food was brought to the barracks in some big containers, you know, large containers. At one, there were two men served the, uh, the food. They would walk around with a canister of this syrup in it, which they would give us a spoon of for our bread. At one point, the guy holding the canister of syrup dropped it. Without a blink, both of them got down to the floor and started licking up from the floor. Because the they were so hungry. So hungry. There's no way that you make you, you let that go to waste, you understand? Now, that sight was so heartbreaking that here were Jews getting down on the floor to slurp up syrup that was on the floor. You said in your book, when did you get the sense that you were becoming less of a being? That was a, when I read that, it, it was so powerful, it jumped out at me. I, I've i never stopped thinking about it. Because well, the thought of becoming less of a being. Oh, that came with Rivesalt. Did, is that well, how you saw yourself? N well, I never stopped feeling that I was a human being. Uh, bear in mind that I was with my mother. With my mother, with a rock of Gibraltar, I could go anywhere. I was very safe with the Rock of Gibraltar. And uh, my mother and I had a very good relationship. I was a good kid. What were the sanitation conditions like? You know, when we were in Reise Beidou, we know we were being deprived of, of food, of school, of things like that. When we arrived in Rivesalt, uh, as I wrote in my memoirs, I felt that now we descended into the second circle of hell. And that, that's where I felt that we were really being dehumanized. That's when I felt we were really being treated. By, by the way, the guards were not Germans, you understand. These were Vichy France guards, civilians who took that job. You know, uh, when we were moved to Rivesalt, um, the situation was vastly different. The barracks, the conditions in the barracks were miserable. Beds along each wall. Um, the bedding was very critical for me uh, because we had mattresses that were made of sackcloth. Do you know what sackcloth is? Yes. People don't use sackcloth anymore these days. But, you know, what you, harsh linen, not linen, but harsh material stuff, filled with straw on two by fours with wires stretched across. Those were our beds, a mattress on that wooden structure. We had an army blanket, that was it. In this hotel, they didn't provide sheets, right? Now, one of the critical things, no, I won't go there yet. I mentioned what our diet was, right? If you needed to go to the bathroom, you had to go to another barrack. Now, that doesn't sound like very much in the summertime or the springtime or even the fall, but in the wintertime, when you had to go and pee, it was a trip. It was cold, it was muddy. After it had snowed, it was slushy. But if you had to empty your bladder, or more than that, 
There was only one place to do it. I told you about the food. Let me go back. By the way, there was no heat in the barracks. Uh, they didn't dare. I mean, it was a wooden barrack. They, they were not unwise. But we were allowed to gather wood to make small fires outside. And as kids, we took on that assignment. And I had a small wooden sack. I don't know where the hell my mother ever got a small uh, sack of, a, again, potato sack type thing where I, I, we would gather wood, I would gather wood. Uh, now we had friends, I had two friends. We were the three musketeers, by the way. You know, and uh, we would go and gather wood to make small fires outside. Let me go back to the bedding, because that's a critical issue for me. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm the kind of, and was the kind of kid, who couldn't stand wool against the skin. You know, uh, even to this day, I have, my wife likes to say I have delicate skin. I don't like for her to say that, but she likes to say it. Yeah. Didn't bother me at all. The wool blanket, the sackcloth, no problem. I tolerated it very well. Didn't even think about it. By the way, if, when you were cold and you had to go out, given the, the, that we had no clothes, really, essentially, uh, you used your blanket to cover yourself to go to the bathroom. When I later wrote my memoirs, you know, on the 60th anniversary of my mother's being sent to Auschwitz, when I came to the point of describing the barracks and of describing the sack, you know, the mattress and so forth, I began to develop a severe itching. And um, I thought, hey, I'm a doctor, you know, it's poison ivy. Yeah. But it kept on sticking. I went to my dermatologist and he said, do you have poison ivy in your backyard? I said, no, 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 Bernie, no, Bernie. This looks like it could be some allergic reaction. We're going to take you off your meds. You know, I was already taking blood pressure medication then. They took me off all my meds, put me on new medication. The, the rash continued. And uh, Bernie, my dermatologist, said to me, uh, Henry, you know, his psychiat psychiatrist patient, Excuse me for asking, but are you worried about something? Bernie, I'm writing my Holocaust memoirs. This is a numular eczema. Now this was in 2002 that I told him that. I still have my numular eczema. When I told him about it, he said, Henry, you're going to have that numular eczema for the next 30 years. 30 years, Bernie, wait a minute. <laughs> I ain't living that long. What he meant is that it is unyielding, and any stress will rouse it. You, know? you, you mentioned in your memoirs that you found a, a hole in the fence, and you said the Germans would not have allowed that hole to be there. And that's the, f the spot where you escaped, and that was May 1st. We had had Passover, and, uh, and my mother uh, said to me, Aaron, that's my Yiddish name, I want you to escape. To escape. With you, Ma, I'll go anywhere. No, no. I can't go with you. You have to go by yourself. I was then 12 years old. 
I looked at her face. When your mother looks like that, I said to her in Yiddish, Ja, mach vertundus. Yes, ma, I'll do that. I was flabbergasted. But looking at my mother, geez, hey. So when? Let's do it on May 1st. You do it on May 1st. Why May 1st? Because in Europe, May 1st is Labor Day. And she assumed that there would be fewer guards. And she was right. May 1st, I got up, waited till I got my, first, my piece of bread in the morning. I do not remember saying goodbye to my mother. I know I did. My mother was a touchy-feely mom, you know. And um, I know we hugged. And I left. I, my my uh, thesis was that I was to act as if I'm going out to pick up some wood for our fire, and at some point. Now, my mother got information from two Ose workers who were stationed in Rivesaud. Ose, O-S-E, stands for Oeuvre de Secours aux Enfants, Works to Help Children. And it's an old organization that is a social service type of organization. She knew how much money it would cost for me to take a train to go to Marseille, where the central bureau of the Ose was located, and that they would help me from there. So I got money from her. I got the directions as to where I was to go. And, and I went. Uh, and uh, I described my, how I escaped, you know, in the book. Um, I crawled to the, the, on one side of Rivesalt was a train tracks, two train, two, tra two train tracks. And the ground was somewhat elevated by about five feet. Uh, the camp was on this side. I assumed that if I can get over that five foot fence, so to speak, that I probably would not be as visible as on this side of the camp. So I crawled to get to that, pay, that place and I uh, got to it, looked up to see if there were any guards. And as I write in my book, there were no guards there. They were probably all in the latrine. Or maybe the one or two guards who were there were in the latrine, but there were no guards there. In any case, I didn't think except to get the hell out of there. I got up ran over the, uh, the the hill and started to run like hell. And I kept running like hell till I got to some small brushes, small trees. I slowed my pace down some, but I continued to run and finally got to the highway, which I knew would take me to Perpignan. And uh, fortunately, there was a big ditch on the side of the road. This was farmland, you know. And um, I walked along the ditch, 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers, about eight miles, or something like that. Got to Perpignan, was very easy to see. Uh, there were no uh, workers in the fields. It was Labor Day, you know. So I'm sure that nobody saw me. I got into Perpignan. It was very easy. It was a small town. It was easy to see where the train station was. Uh, I went to the train station. You know, if you're going to escape from somewhere, the trick is you never look at anybody. You're like when you were a kid and you played like, I don't see anybody. Nobody sees me, you know. You don't look at anybody, you just keep right on going. 
went to the train station, uh, I went to the guichet, to the counter, and asked for a train uh, ticket to Marseille, noticed that I wasn't looking at the, just put the money on the counter. Person didn't even look, I don't even know whether it was a man or a woman. I uh, gave me a ticket to, to a train to Marseille, a little bit of change. And here I was with my ticket and my change. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon by the time I got there. The train was at 11 o'clock at night. You know, the way I looked, double shirts, double socks, double pants. People didn't know that I was doubled up that way, but I was. That was what I was carrying. I couldn't stay in the train station. Be crazy. In France, fortunately, at that time, they still had outdoor toilets, you know. And as I walked out of the train station, I saw one of them in some in a distance. I realized I get into one of those cubicles there. If there's a door on it, I've got it made. I did. There were indeed doors on the cubicles. I was safe. You know how nice it is to be in a toilet with a cubicle door that you can close? I was safe. At least I was out of result. Now the next thing was be to get to the train and keep going. At a certain point I could see there was a little window that was, had been dark already for a while. I got out, I had no watch, went to the train station. It was fairly close to 11, how I guess that I have no idea. Um, I made sure that I did not stay in the station, that I would go to the platform where the train would come, where it was darker, you know. Um, there's so many people. Uh, I got on a train, there was standing room only. This was war. Where the hell were people all going? Nobody was in uniform, you know. There were no seats, so it was one of those trains where there was an aisle by the window and compartments, you know, one of those old-fashioned trains. So I was standing in the aisle. I hadn't eaten since morning. Uh, I was rocking because that's what trains do, you know. And I was almost falling asleep, but <laughs> you don't dare. You're awake for the duration. The guy was standing next to me, came a little closer, quietly, and he said to me in French, Je sais d'où tu viens. I know where you're coming from. I hadn't eaten much. I had only a piece of bread in the morning, but I feared that I was going empty my empty bowl into my pants. Scared shitless. He saw my reaction and he said, don't be afraid, n'aie pas peur. Don't be afraid. Whew. At the he asked me, are you hungry? <laughs> it wasn't a joke, he meant it. You know. I said, yes, oui, j'ai bien faim. He gave me my first meal at the next uh, train stop where we all descended for a break, you know. He pulled out rations, a ration book from his pocket. And I could see that he had given me some of his monthly rationed food. I didn't know that they were rationing food then. What well, we were eating in the camps, you know, that didn't need rationing. Nobody would eat it. Just an average man, businessman, nothing remarkable about him except his humanity. And this is where I quote Primo Levi particularly, because Primo Levi, if you re read his Auschwitz story, talked about the fact that there was an Italian worker there by the name of Lorenzo. 
these, you know, the Nazis had factories in Auschwitz. And, um, and, and the, the Lorenzo worked in one of the factories. But he befriended Primo Levi, Primo Levi being, of course, a chemist from Torino in Italy. And uh, so this was my Lorenzo. Bought me a meal, told me what was going on. I got back on the train. The train was virtually empty. Oh, where was he going? He was going skiing. He was going skiing while we were in concentration camps. Look, he was a nice guy. The French people just went on with their lives while we were starving. Of course, they were pretty hungry themselves, too. You, know. you met your mother the, for the last time she was let out of the detention center to meet with you, and that was the last time you saw your mother. When I got off the train in Marseille, I was sent immediately to a home for children. The Ose had some 33 homes for children in the free zone, in the Vichy France. Uh, I was there for about a year, and that was a wonderful. We were starving just as well, but it was a wonderful environment. You know, this was La Villa Mariana in Saint Raphael, which is a beautiful a place on the Mediterranean coast. The directress of the house came to me and said, uh, Henri, you are going to go to America. I said, America? Well, uh, moi? America? Wonderful. Um, uh, my mother too? No, 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 no. Only children were allowed to go. Whoa. What they were able to do, and what the Vichy France government allowed, for reasons which I won't go into here, is that they allowed the mothers, or the parents, of children who were being sent on this convoy of 50 kids, on which I came, to say their goodbyes. And that was about a year after I had escaped from Rivesalt. I know my mother came. I know we met. I don't remember anything. And um, there were about eight mothers who came from Reeves Um And they all, evidently, according to uh, a person who wrote her memoirs, who was one of the Jose workers, that all of the mothers came back to Rivesalt because they did want, didn't want to interfere with their children being sent to America. Uh, I came to America. Uh, we were on a French boat. We had to go to Casablanca because we couldn't cross the Atlantic because America was at war with Germany then. And. Um, we arrived in America, you know, there was food on the ship. So guess what happens to me, right? I got seasick. I got so seasick I couldn't eat for three days. It was terrible. In any case, we got to America. What, what happened to your mother after she went back to Reevesville? I learned a number of years later that three months after I had arrived, in New York. My mother had been sent to Auschwitz. Now, what happened is that the Americans had landed in North Africa. And uh, according to uh, Shire, uh, the Germans were worried that the, fr that the Americans would land through France. And so they occupied the rest of France, and they also wanted to get the, the fleet, the French fleet, in Toulon. But the French destroyed that, believe it or not. Uh, when the Germans then invaded the rest of France, they began to, they continued the process of sending Jews 
to the death camps. Okay. I later learned that my mother had been sent to Auschwitz three months after I had arrived. Um, not only did the Germans uh, invade the rest of France, but on January 25, I think, 1941 or 42, the um, final solution was decided at the Wannsee Conference Center. Right. Yeah, thanks. In a 90-minute meeting, uh, the final solution was decided. Now, that was January 25, so by August 14, 1942, which is when my mother was sent to Auschwitz, this was Convoy 19. By that time, uh, and the French government, by the in, at the end of it all, had sent 75,000 Jews to Auschwitz from France. My mother was on Condom 19, and I have a photo of that, in, which I have in the book, the, con the, the train on which she was sent. Uh, I was sent to the Wagner family. I was, of course, with the Wagner family. I went through high school there, um, went into music school because I was discovered that I have a singing voice, have a degree from Carnegie Mellon in music. Uh, went into the army for two years, the military, the American army, served in the medical corps. And while I was in the military, I decided that I did not want to take the chance of being a musician because I could then not guarantee that I would be able to recreate a family. And so I decided to go into medicine. I want to ask you about that. When did you find out uh, what happened to your mother at Auschwitz? I found that out from Judy Kestenberg, who was a child analyst colleague, who herself, a, she had left Europe before it all started, but she collected data on children who, as children, had uh, come over from the, uh, from, from the camps. Holocaust survivors. And um, she asked if, she, if I would interview, if she could interview me. And I uh, told Judy, whom I loved dearly, that I just couldn't do it. And she asked, she's so persistent, <laughs> this little woman, you know, so persistent. She asked me the third year that she asked me, she said to me, I'll tell you what, Henri, you let me interview you, and I promise you that I will find out what happened to your mother. Now, bear in mind, this was already in the, what, 1970s, I, I don't know when it was, really, that I hadn't heard from my mother, and I wondered, what the hell is going on? You know, the war's been over for a long time. The Jewish Social Service who were responsible for us had no idea what had happened. You know, the Germans were very the Germans were very good. They collected all the names of all the people they sent to the death camps. Right. And that's there's a list. You can access that now. So she went to that listing, Serge Klarsfeld. Serge, Serge Klarsfeld is the name of that uh, that person. He's a lawyer and uh, something else. And she discovered my mother's name by going through that listing. Have you ever gone to Auschwitz? I went to Auschwitz finally in 1979, I think it was. After you found out about your mother's death? After I found out about my mother's <clears throat> death. I went there to be where she had been. And um, two of my sons, uh, out of the three, our third son couldn't come at the time, uh, went with my wife and one of our grandchildren. And two of my colleagues wanted to come with us, analysts. And we went to Auschwitz, and it was terrible. Uh, we went to the 
you know, we made the tour um, where all the clothes are and all the hair and all the glasses and all the shoes. And, uh, and then we went across to a barrack across from those barracks <clears throat> where they, uh, is the mourning house uh, for uh, visitors. We went in there, and uh, El Mole Rahamim, which is one of the prayers for the dead, is sung continually. There's a recording of it uh, that is, goes on all the time. And on the floor in the small uh, morning room is a glass case. And uh, I can't even remember what's in it. But um, it's probably a, a Torah. I, I don't know. And uh, the whole family, we just, arms around each other, we just sat there and st stood there. Yep. You wanted me to ask you, because I thought that it was the most traumatic thing that a 12-year-old boy could experience, or a 12-year-old girl could experience. Mm -hmm. And you said to me that the camps were not the most traumatic thing that you could suffer. Uh, yes. Uh, and I'm glad that you're asking that. You know, as a child analyst who has committed much of his work, you know, I decided to go into child analysis and child psychiatry because as a child I knew what being traumatized is and I wanted to help kids. That's why I went into child psychiatry and child analysis. I um, found in the course of my work that some kids had been traumatized in a very different way than I had. They were traumatized at home. So many children are maltreated at home, are neglected, are physically injured by their own mothers and fathers. My mother loved me. I had a rock that I could stand on for the rest of my life. It was the enemy who tried to destroy us. Think of the kids who come from homes where their mothers and fathers are trying to destroy them. You're going to tell me that that's less traumatizing than what I went through? I was safe in my mother's heart. She was safe in my heart. Look, the Germans, we all knew the Germans wanted to destroy the Jews. What child comes into the world saying, oh, I know my mother wants to destroy me? That's much more traumatizing. And I have worked with people, I've worked with adults who have been traumatized. Right? What did you want to achieve today with our interview? I want to prevent children from being maltreated at home, abused, and we have developed a 37-year-long project. We have developed materials for parenting to optimize parenting by means of parenting education. We developed a textbook a curriculum for teaching parenting to school-age children from grades K through 12. Did you hear what I said? Yes. Right? And we have two volumes of workshops for teachers and anybody who takes care of children for how to optimize children's development. The second major thing that I have done and that I continue to do is that through our research, I developed an alternate theory of aggression which holds that hostility in human beings is generated in them by psychic pain. So right now you think I'm a nice guy, but if I start calling you an effing Italian uneducated jerk, you would be so insulted I would have injured your narcissism. 
and that would cause you psychic pain. How do you think you would feel toward me for doing that to you? I would think it would be inappropriate. No. You would be mad as hell with me. Even if on television you would say it's inappropriate, you would use some other words, and you would want to sock me, at least. I say that it's excessive psychic pain that generates hostility in human beings. Now, if you take large groups, like the French and the Germans, or the Americans and the North Koreans, and they keep on insulting each other well enough, what is going to happen? Somebody's going to take a sock at somebody. A big sock. I ask you about your mother. What happened to your brother and your father? I don't know. One of the, of the terrible things about losing all of your sources of information when you're 12 years old is that you never thought of asking about it before. How was I to know that I would never see my mother again? But you know, I really, for the few moments we have left, I really want to point out that I feel very gratified at the work I am doing by means of my institute, by means of what I have learned. And what I was saying to you a moment ago, John, is that large group conflicts are created by what we do to each other. Now, one of the books I wrote in 2014 is called War is Not Inevitable. That title stands for the fact that when Albert Einstein asked Sigmund Freud in 1932, is there any way of protecting humanity from the menace of war? Freud, who believed that we are born with a destructive drive, said to Einstein, it is not possible because we are born with a death instinct, a self-destructive instinct, which our life instincts compel us to externalize, and as a result, we attack others who give us cause to attack them. So Freud said, if no matter what you do, the death instinct is going to make you seek out people to attack. And I say that's not true. The research that we did, a 37-year project starting with mothers and infants, seeing them twice a week for seven years and then follow-ups, is that it's excessive psychic pain that is activated, in, that is uh, uh, produced in children, that generates in them the wish to destroy. But they can't destroy it toward their own mother. They can't direct it toward their own mother and father, can they? What would happen? They'd be homeless and that they'd get kicked out before they even get far. So they displace it. They displace it. Oh, you insulted my mother? I'll direct my accumulated hostility toward you. And that's what we do. One large group to another large group. The French had three wars in 150 years just on the basis of that dynamic. That's what I want to prevent. Do you still remember the poem, The Crow and the Fox? I do. Can you recite it for me? Are you sure you want me to? Of course. En français? I don't think you can say it in English. I can't. <laughs> Maître Corbeau, sur un arbre perché, tenait dans son bec un fromage. Maître Renard, par l'odeur alléchée, lui teint à peu près ce langage. « Et bonjour, monsieur le corbeau, que vous êtes joli, que vous me semblez beau, sans mentir. Si votre ramage se rapporte à votre plumage, vous êtes le phénix des hôtes de ces bois. » À ces mots, 
le corbeau ne se sent plein de joie, ouvre son large bec, laisse tomber sa proie. Le renard s'en saisit et dit, « Mon bon monsieur, apprenez que tout flatteur vise aux dépens de celui qui l'écoute. Cette leçon vaut bien un fromage, sans doute. Le corbeau, honteux et confus, jura, mais un peu tard, qu'on ne l'y prendrait plus. A brief translation. A fox, a, a, drawn by the smell of cheese, sees a crow sitting in, high in a tree with a cheese in his mouth. And the fox says to the crow, Oh, you are so beautiful. Really, if your feathers are in accord with your heritage, you are the phoenix of these woods. The crow, so proud, opened his large beak, dropped his cheese. The fox seized it and said to him, Dear Mr. Crow, Learn that all flatterers live at the expense of those who listen to them. <laughs> the crow, ashamed and embarrassed, said that would never happen to him again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the time. It was, it was truly, in your words, a mitzvah for me. Well, thank you. It was a real, truly a gift. I appreciate it very much. With Dr. Henry Perrins, this is John Ricciuti. I hope you found this very educational and informative. Thank you very much, and until next time.